oblige. Euh, je propose que l'on lance directement euh, le film. Bien, bonjour à toutes et tous. Uh, Welcome, everyone, and uh, please uh, switch off your mic and choose the language that you would like to uh, listen by clicking on interpretation. My name is Jérôme Auslander, a deputy mayor of Clermont-Ferrand, and I am really happy to welcome you for this virtual conference, the first of this kind of the International Network of the Michelin Cities about the topic of urban resilience. After Clermont-Ferrand in 2017, Victor, Victoria Gasteis in 2019, we were supposed to be gathering in Querétaro. At, by the end of February 2021. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we had to postpone this meeting for uh, this international meeting that is so important for the network of uh, cities. In spite of the difficulties, the members of the International Network of Michelin Cities uh, wanted to go on with the work that had already been done together. And uh, uh, we came up with new practices to adapt to this context. So this is the approach that we're using to organize uh, uh, this virtual conference about the topic of urban uh, resilience that is uh, at the uh, core of our priorities as uh, uh, local governments responsible for the good quality and access of uh, public services uh, for our citizens. So we are going to speak about resilience by in three different perspectives economic, environmental, and social response, social resilience. For each of them, we are going to listen to contributors, experts, uh, uh, contributions by experts of uh, uh, cities to dwell upon the notion of resilience. And uh, we are going to speak about uh, about resilience as the basis of transformations and transitions that consider uh, the lifestyle of humanity, such as natural systems uh, and our uh, rural and urban areas. The topics that will be tackled today will be deepened further during the next international meetings that will take place in presence in Querétaro. Uh, and uh, the mayor of the cities, Luis Bernardo, now is going to speak about them. But before giving the floor to David Mitchell, I would like to thank all the experts who accepted invitation for this meeting, and in particular, Mr. David Miller, Director of International Diplomacy C40 Cities, Cities Climate Leadership Group, former mayor of Toronto, Canada, and author, author of the book, Solved How the World's Great Cities Are Fixing the Climate crisis. Mrs. Kochikon Vorakum, CEO and founder of Porous City Network and Land Process Bangkok. She's also president of the Climate Change Working Group and uh, of the International Federation of Landscape Architect. And I would also like to thank uh, Mrs. Ferdo Susidom, Special Advisor to the General Secretary of uh, the UCLG, United Cities and Local Governments. Uh, and also member of uh, the International Network of Michelin Cities. I would also like to thank all the members of our network who helped organize uh, this uh, event. And uh, I wish you uh, uh, a really rich discussion. And now I would like to give the floor to uh, David Mitchell, who is also mayor of Bridgewater, Canada. And uh, we will go into speak about the first uh, uh, presentation, reshaping the economic thinking of tomorrow. The floor to you. Merci, Jérôme. Uh, good morning, good evening, uh, good night <laughs> to our members from wherever you are. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, who is uh, David Miller, Director of International Diplomacy 
for the C40 Cities uh, Climate Change Leadership Group. Um, so he is uh, the that international diplomacy uh, <laughs> director and global ambassador of inclusive climate action at C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. He is responsible for supporting mayors in their climate leadership and for building a global movement for socially equitable action to mitigate and to adapt to climate change. He served as the chair of the C40 cities from 2008 until 2010. Uh, David Miller was also the mayor of Toronto from 2003 to 2010. And under his leadership, Toronto became wildly admired internationally for its environmental leadership, economic strength and social integration. He is a leading advocate for the creation of sustainable urban economies and a strong and forceful champion for the next generation of jobs through sustainability. He's held a variety of public and private positions and served as Future of Cities Global Fellow at Polytechnic Institute of New York uh, University from 2011 to uh, 2014. He is a Harvard trained economist professionally. He is a lawyer and author of the book, as Jerome said, Solved, How the World's Great Cities Are Fixing the Climate Crisis. Now, before I turn over uh, the microphone to uh, David Miller, I want to tell you a little story about how I uh, became uh, friends with David and how we met. Uh, Bridgewater, for those who don't know, in Nova Scotia is about 2,000 kilometers away from Toronto. So uh, not particularly close. It's about a two-hour two flight. And back in 2008, uh, I flew to Toronto for business and uh, tried to set up a meeting with then Mayor of Toronto, David Miller, thinking perhaps it would be a slim chance to be able to, uh, to meet someone who was going to be clearly very busy. Um, he immediately uh, set some time to meet with me and I invited him to come to Bridgewater to speak about Toronto's success in, with sustainability, thinking this could inspire, hopefully inspire our community as we move towards a more sustainable future. Um, David did not hesitate he, uh, he agreed to come to speak. He flew the 2000 kilometers uh, to Halifax and then drove the hour and a half down to Bridgewater. And he gave us an entire day of his time um, and, and really inspired our community and set us down the path that we're on now. And uh, after he speaks, I'll just give you a quick, quick update on Energize Bridgewater. But uh, the result of uh, where we are today is uh, directly impacted by the leadership of David Miller and, um, and his willingness to really give back to communities that are trying so hard to, to lead us into a sustainable future. So it is my great pleasure to introduce my friend, David Miller, to speak to you today. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mayor Mitchell. And thank you for, for your leadership um, and uh, your gracious words. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, um, et, uh, merci pour l'opportunité de faire... Thanks a lot for your opportunity uh, to share with you a, a presentation, a short presentation. My, the topic of my book is climate change and the actions of uh, big cities of uh, the world uh, uh, to fight against climate change. Broader context. Um, I have about 10 minutes and what I'd like to speak to uh, is the, the context of the leadership of the mayors of the world's great cities on climate change uh, in the context of a global pandemic um, and how they are using innovation, clear thinking, and uh, lessons drawn from uh, over a decade of, of work on climate change to address the pandemic. Uh, Ellen, I'm going to try and share my screen, if that is uh, allowed. Um, yes, David, just try. There we go. Is that working? Uh, good. Great. That's great. Yes. Merci, Ellen. Um, so last year, so the C40, um, where, uh, as uh, David Conley introduced, uh, I, I work as an organization now of 97 mayors. It started as 40, hence the name. 
very loosely speaking, uh, half Global North and Global South, and 40 of the mayors uh, on commencement of the world's great cities. Uh, all of the cities represented in the Michelin network and towns are great, uh, but the C40 was uh, cities like Paris, uh, London, Jakarta, Cape Town, and of course, Toronto. When the, and they've been founded on the principle that the voices and actions of uh, these mayors and their cities can help the world avoid dangerous climate change. So when the pandemic struck last year, the mayors came together because they felt a need to speak with their peers as mayors and to address uh, the pandemic both in a response and in a recovery. And what I'm going to speak to today is the work that's been done to think about how we recover from a pandemic uh, in a green and just way. And to, to do that, the C40 convened a task force um, under the authority of its chair, Mayor Garcetti from Los Angeles, uh, but led by, the task force was led by Mayor Giuseppe Sala of Milan. And it included uh, a number of mayors from uh, global cities, um, uh, about 12, uh, including all the major regions of the world. And it developed critical principles that I think uh, are very helpful in guiding our thinking about how cities, towns, and national governments should be investing in order to help the economic and social recovery from the pandemic. Um, and these are the, the first ones. I think the, the prime run here to think about uh, is the recovery can't be a return to business as usual because the business as usual for the world was putting us on a path to three degrees of global heating, which meant that climate change would be unstoppable and the consequences extremely serious for human civilization and the planet. And the, the second principles, as you see, speak to the resilience and, and equitable outcomes that are needed in communities from um, pandemic response. Um, and so there, there were nine principles, uh, including that national governments direct invest uh, direct invest directly, excuse me, into cities to ensure that those cities could support their people and make the right kinds of investments themselves. And the the task force was convened um, with the ongoing idea of the C40 that the this organization exists to help the mayors act and act more strongly, and also to speak to national government. So it's not an advocacy organization, although there is a national role, as of course, uh, in the significant investments that, that have been and are being and will be made from stimulus, but there are also critical actions happening today at the local level that really support uh, a green and um, just recovery. So the members of the task force spoke to actions that they are doing, around the creation of 15 minute cities, the idea, for example, the idea that we can create places to live where people's needs are met uh, a short distance from their house so that those cities can prioritize active transportation um, and mitigate against the need for workers to live a very long way from uh, where they work, particularly low income workers. Uh, speaking to the need for mass transit, Medellin, for example, is actually actively building mass transit uh, in the pandemic, supporting essential workers, creating green jobs. Seoul, as part of its pandemic response, is instituting a massive program of energy retrofits in buildings to lower their energy requirements, make them <clears throat> better buildings over time, more affordable to run, and of course, and create massive numbers of jobs, in that case, 22,000 jobs. The research, though, shows a very serious challenge that a very small percentage of global stimulus is green. Um, and that's a significant worry, because if national governments uh, uh, replicate simply the, the dirty industries of the past, we will have a real problem in moving forward uh, in a green way. And we cannot meet the 1.5 degree trajectory prescribed by science, which requires us to have global emissions by 2030. So as the remainder of the stimulus rolls out and as 
local governments invest uh, in their communities um, and, and use stimulus funds where provided, it is very critical that these funds be invested in sustainable ways. Um, and this, uh, this slide describes why and shows some, some details about um, how important it is to commit stimulus funds to having emissions by 2030. It's possible if we act now because it builds on what's happening uh, municipally. And the good news is uh, green and just recovery in C40 cities alone. So those cities represent about 750 million people in the urban region a significant proportion, about 25% of the world GDP. In those cities alone, if stimulus funds are invested in green, our studies show that there will be 50 million more good sustainable jobs uh, than business as usual. A very significant outcome for mayors and national governments. Significant reduction to air pollution by up to 30% in these cities and of course, significant health-related economic benefits if we build cities uh, that are healthier for people. Um, over five years, more benefits on reduced emissions, air quality, health, jobs, and economics. And I would just like to point to one city to illustrate uh, what we mean by this, which is Lisbon. Lisbon has done a fascinating job using the need for equitable action uh, to address challenges either caused by or revealed by the pandemic, but doing it in a way that is building a city that is going to be far more sustainable for the future. So they have used e European Union stimulus funds to build new rapid transit and are starting that work, or have literally already started that work. And then secondly, they use their own legislative authority to help low-income workers live inside Lisbon. Like many of our cities, the core of Lisbon have become an increasingly expensive place to live, partly driven by tourism. So during the pandemic, Lisbon essentially outlawed short-term rentals for tourist purposes in the core of the city, and then entered agreements with private landlords and individuals to rent apartments in order to re-rent them at below market rates to low-income working people so they could live near where they worked with very positive environmental benefits, health benefits, uh, transportation benefits uh, with, with much fewer congestion. A very good example of action and leadership by a city, partly funded by national governments, but also within the competence of the city. And the final point I wanted to make is just to mention uh, the, the work of my book, uh, which is about the broader perspective. And it shows examples from cities around the world who are acting on climate change today with the right plans, the right actions in buildings, transportation, waste, and energy. And the theory of the book is that if we take these ideas and that are actually working today, are financially feasible today, and are producing jobs and other benefits in addition to environmental benefits and spread those ideas globally, uh, we will be able to have global emissions by 2030, but that needs to start with getting the stimulus uh, post COVID right. So those, those are the comments I had today. I appreciate your time and attention and I look forward uh, to the upcoming conversation with Mayor Mitchell. Thank you and merci beaucoup. Thank you so much, David, for that. Um, and uh, for anyone who hasn't read David's book, I can tell you that it is, it is a educational, it's a good read, uh, so that's important, but it's also very educational. And um, for me personally, I liked being able to extract the success stories and the practical information of it, um, because as we have more and more success stories across uh, the global community, those examples um, build the momentum. It's easier to uh, explain to your community why we should do something when we can build on the success of another community that has demonstrated that it will work. Mm. Um, now, before we just jump into the, to the questions and answers uh, that we have, I've been asked just to give a quick update on the, um, the Energize Bridgewater uh, project. So when we last mm. met at our, our in-person <coughs> conference in uh, Victoria Gastez, 
Uh, a lot has happened <clears throat> with our Energized Bridgewater <clears throat> program. As many of you likely know, in May of 2019, we won Canada's Smart City Challenge. And with that, uh, $5 million of federal funding for our plan. Which, uh, what this has meant, however, is a complete change in the scope and scale of Energized Bridgewater, not to mention the timing of the project itself. So as a quick refresher, in our community, 40% of our population live in energy poverty. And what that means is that 40% of people spend more than 10% of their household income on their energy needs, from home heating and cooling, to cooking, to transportation. And what's interesting about this is that we are not unique. And while the number of people in your community might not be uh, as high as 40%, it is likely pretty close. Our plan is to address this through uh, various initiatives from home energy retrofits to community energy systems like solar gardens and microgrids. And we're developing a coordinated access system, which is a, a single coordinated intake process for program participants with a specific focus uh, on households at risk. <coughs> and using that data, <coughs> we'll be able to then work on our uh, mobility improvement systems as well. <coughs> our, uh, our smart cities win means that we can do more faster and lift people out of energy poverty a generation sooner. So really the update right now is that we are slowing down in order to speed up because uh, we are literally the only place in Canada doing what we are doing. So we're in a development phase right now, back to the drawing board in a way, because instead of uh, this just being a town of Bridgewater project, it is now something that has some national significance. And as we know, some international significance as well. And that's because this is scalable and shareable. So this means our story uh, can be your story. And as partners in the INMC, we know that by helping each other through idea sharing, best practices and learning from speakers like the uh, incredible ones we have today, the futures of all our communities will be brighter. Um, so reach out if you have uh, any questions or there's some information on the uh, INMC website. So without further ado, let's jump into some uh, questions and answers with, uh, with our speaker, Mayor Miller. And so I'll, I'll start, uh, David, thank you again. So you were mayor from, uh, of Toronto from 2003 to 2010, but it was very quickly into your early years as mayor that you led Toronto through a green transition. Now this was long before there was this global consensus on climate change or a big push among politicians around the world to fight it. So what led you to making this a priority years ago? And how were you able to convince the people of Canada's largest city that this must be a priority? Well, I, I think three things. Uh, first of all, my own personal values coming from when uh, I was a child, I grew up in a small farming village in England. Um, so uh, I didn't realize it until on reflection, looking back, but uh, both social justice and environmental values were really inculcated in me as, as a young boy uh, living in that environment in the 1960s uh, in England, in a very class-based society, but also one which by modern terms ran organic farms and was very, very conscious of its connection with the environment. So I think that was there. Secondly, one of the reasons I ran for municipal office was a belief in the importance of public transport to, uh, to a city for equity and transportation and environmental reasons. And it really drove my agenda. And once you start thinking about public transport and the importance of it, it's very easy to understand uh, other environmental initiatives and their necessity in a big city. And the third is I was probably a bit fortunate. Torontonians, despite the fact we live in this huge city that uh, geographically is spread out as the heart of a region of over 6 million people, are very environmentally conscious. It's a very green city. We have three major river valleys running through the city and because of a hurricane in 1954, uh, those river valleys were preserved as green. So I, I think I was building on policy interests of mine, some deeply held values, uh, and also a, a, a very supportive group of residents who, who also hold deep environmental values. Fantastic, thank you. Um, in your book, Solved, you ask a very direct question. Why cities? The leaders joining us today understand why. Uh, and we're working to do our part. But a lot of times we seem to be fighting an uphill battle against other levels of government. 
in your experience, how can we more effectively work with multiple levels of government globally uh, to convince them that our goals can and should be more aligned when it comes to a post-COVID green recovery? Um, and do you have, uh, you've given us some examples of who's doing that, but perhaps a, a couple more examples of how, who's been most successful. Yeah, I, one of my frustrations when I was in office was I would have colleagues who were mayors or councillors who would get elected to the national government, or in Canada, we have provincial governments, uh, subnational. And within a month, they'd forget all about where they came from. And I'm sure colleagues on this call have seen that as well. I, I think <laughs> the approach needs to be twofold, and that's what we try to do at C40. Uh, I think it's best when we assert our uh, leadership as mayors in cities and towns in areas where we can, and we do have very, our responsibilities have very direct impact on environmental issues and on social justice issues. In Toronto's case, it was responsible for affordable housing, income supports, transport, the urban forest, parks, you know, almost everything, but, but the military and universities. Um, not everybody has all those authorities, but our municipal authorities are uniquely suited to a combination of environmental and social justice. And I, I believe when we lead with our action, we are much more credible. And we also need to lead with our voices. And in my experience, our voices are most powerful when we align around one or two common interests that help everyone and push those extremely strongly. For example, stimulus funding green and just. And the voice of mayors and cities and towns when it's combined uh, cannot be uh, ignored by most national governments. Wonderful, thank you. Um, you've mentioned this well, the, the global pandemic has been one of the biggest challenges of our lifetime. It also presents an opportunity for that green and just recovery. Now that said, uh, the financial crisis of 2008 was also a great opportunity for equality and change. So um, why, why is this time different? This time can be different. It's not necessarily different, but it can be different if we think about people first. From my very personal perspective, and I was mayor through the financial crisis, the national governments and international institutions tried to solve problems for international institutions and um, the banking sector and not for people. This time, people have clearly seen that in the pandemic, we're all in it together and we need a collective response. And that includes a national response and local responses. People expect it. And I believe they're gonna expect that on climate change. And it gives a requirement for everybody in positions of leadership to help shape the pandemic response around the green and just values and principles that I spoke about a few minutes ago. And I, I think those principles are incredibly useful because they respond to what people are feeling and saying. And you can see globally where people have, governments have not, whether local or national, and there's both, have not handled the pandemic response very well. They're in serious trouble. But where they have, they're given a lot of credibility. And uh, that speaks to where uh, citizens are at. They're thinking about collective response, competent response to global problems, and they expect action, an action that helps them uh, as well. And, and those principles are available on the C40 website, and I think they're a good, very good place to start. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and just in the essence of time, I'm actually gonna to skip to my last question. And this is probably a tough one. Um, from the Green Standard in Toronto to the Green New Deal globally, you've been on the front lines in the fight against climate change for a very long time. Uh, what has been the project, policy or idea that has given you the most hope for the future? And can you share why? I, that, uh, that is a very hard question because I would like to speak for about three hours uh, to, to the hope. I think in many ways, it's the light rail transit system in Addis, in Ethiopia. And why is because um, in many places, there are lots of political fights about building public transport and getting the funding to do it. Addis conceived of a project 
conceived of it meeting the needs of uh, uh, the least well-off, conceived of it being structured in a way that met the needs of women who are the predominant transit riders in Addis, conceived of it, found the funding, built it, and it's running, and now they're thinking about extending it, all in the time that post my mayoralty in Toronto, we're still debating what to do. Um, and that's true in many cities. And it was the first light rail project in sub-Saharan Africa. And to me, it's very inspiring. It got a C40 award. It happened to be a year that I was presenting some of the awards, so I got to present it. Uh, and it's inspiring because it shows that learning doesn't come from uh, you know, the global north to the global south. It goes both ways. And if a city like Addis that is not well endowed with financial resources can build infrastructure to meet the needs of its uh, residents in a way that's completely clean, it's entirely powered by clean energy, then we can do that everywhere. Wonderful, thank you for so much for sharing that. Um, if there's any questions, I don't see any questions in the, in the chat box. So I do want to, again, I wanna extend a huge thanks to, uh, to you, uh, David, for coming to, taking the time to speak to us today, uh, inspiring us a little. A little plug for your book, Solved. I would recommend uh, that for all of us. Uh, it's a good read. And um, we look forward to hearing from you, uh, hopefully in the future. There you go. <laughs> and uh, you can buy that online or in your local bookstore, I imagine. And um, again, on behalf of the INMC, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks for having me on. And keep up your good uh, collective international work. It really matters in sharing those ideas can make a very real difference. Thank you, colleagues, so much. Merci, David. Merci, David Miller and David Mitchell aussi. Donc, uh, merci beaucoup pour votre Thank you, David Miller. Thank you, David Mitchell, for your intervention and your words. We're going to move on to the next uh, part of this uh, conference. And the next speaker is Kuchakom Vorakom, who's an, a landscape architect and an expert in developing large green spaces um, built up to resist to climatic change, climate change. So um, coming from a city where infrastructures are developed nonstop, like Bangkok, she can provide incredibly good examples um, of um, urban resilience. So Kochako for a com in 2019, uh, she was at the top list of um, one of the most active uh, leaders in fighting climate change. And in 2020, she was chosen by BBC amongst the 100 women in the year and also uh, the 30 pioneer leaders in uh, uh, fighting climate change. Kochako, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. And thanks, Helen, for introducing me. Um, actually, I'm a landscape architect from Bangkok, Thailand. I'm so honored to be here. Can I share my screen? Yes, you can normally. I think just try coach. Otherwise, we've got another option. Okay. Be okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So I got 10 minutes and I will do my best. So yes, I'm a Time Magazine 15 woman fighting against climate change. And also I was named, uh, yes. I was also named as like a Time 100 um, next. And also the Green 30 for 2020 from, from Bloomsburg. Um, teach, I taught at Harvard University as a landscape architecture department. Uh, Sorry. Just a Sorry. Second. Hold on. 
So I think that one city from Yong from Bangkok is here with us as well. So let's do it again. Okay, great. Um uh also involve a lot with sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, involve a lot with the UN um, in the climate. I'm actually really like surprised, like why they're focusing on the landscape architect. And I'm actually would like to talk in the sense. This is um, the country called Mar Marshall. And considering the country is only like with the airport and few houses because this country is actually sinking. And I'm actually talking um, about wetland. Wetland is the most productive ecology um, unit that happened because it's actually contain more um, car carbon dioxide, CO2, much more, three times much more than forest, but it's it's also been destroyed really quickly because we don't think that, oh, it's a swamp. And swamp may be equal west, west land. And this is us, Bangkok, and the whole city is actually based on swamp. So we destroy all the swamp. And this is what we are right now with our natural barrier. So you can see that when see, we are fighting between sea level rise or we're gonna build faster enough of the wetland to protect our city. It doesn't seem like, because this wetland and swamp is actually takes so much time more, more than just normal forest that we all, all know. So um, this is actually like an hour by car from center of Bangkok. And I just feel that there's so much ignorance about the impact of climate change, not even plus pandemic. And we solved the problem with all this like hard infrastructure, like dams and concrete. And we thought we're gonna better off with all this problem, but it's not. And this is normal, normal for us during the rainy seasons. And you can see how wetland we are, or the swamp area we are. And this is like our neighbor that is like hiding in the city or in the river. And this year we actually um, confronting the most drought in 50 year history. And it's so unexpected. We are working with unexpected. PM 2.5, we export the best rice on earth, but we import all this electronic trash from the developing world, which is so sad. And this is like COVID pandemic, what's happening right now in Thailand. And I really with um, David Miller that all the leader, if you're not talking about public health environment, you are not relevant to what crisis we are confronting right now. So my point is adapt or die. I would want to go with this clip video, short one. So this is not only Bangkok, this is like many cities around the world, Shanghai, Tokyo, some part of it, um, Delta land, and many, many cities in Southeast Asia, like Penang, in Vietnam. We are we are water community, we are water culture, we are amphibious, but we actually forget how we used to live with water. And we are sinking and you can see that the bound. We are on swamp. The whole city, 20 million people dwell on swamp. Mm -hmm. 
And I think when we talk about city, we need to know about the body of the city, the landscape, the seasonal change, and especially for in this region, it's about water. Like flood become a new normal of how we have to deal with city. And what is more dangerous than flood is drought. Like 20 million people might not have water, like fresh water. Right now, we are confronting with sea intrusion. Like the drinking water is tastes like funny, like every year. So that means the sea level is rising or is actually coming underneath our city. So I'm actually create like a park and I will go through very quickly and several projects that make my city more resilient and using natural, natural based solution, which I think this is the only way out that we have to mimic and regenerate the natural system back to our city. And this is... So this is a park I did, and you can see how concrete we are as a city and thinking about it, this is our swamp, used to be swamp, used to be the land that absorbs water, pour us to the water. So there's no question, that's why flood is actually like um, inevitable. So, and we actually, okay, we got a chance. This is like the first new park in 30 years in central Bangkok. So we incline the whole park to collect every drops of rain. Another water that we have to concern, maybe you guys concerned about snow, but us is like rain, rainy season. We are like tropical country. And so we incline the whole park, um, install the park with the um, green roof, um, the rainwater tank with the wetland and then retention pond. And I was so honored, I was, uh, my park was visited by Mr. And Antonio Guterres, the UN secretary like the world figure about climate change. We're talking about pandemic, we are like Thailand, Thai food, we go everything, everything is like good food. But during pandemic, there's some group of people are so vulnerable and they didn't have enough place or safe place to get food and the poverty and many other things. So this is another project that I did. It's the biggest urban farming rooftop in Asia. So, Thinking about the city, all the waste space that needs to be reclaimed to create us a solution for, for, for better off with the climate um, impact. And thinking about food space, waste space, it can be actually paired up. And this, is, this one is actually the biggest one in Asia and maybe the third one in, in the world. So for the single building. So I'm um, actually we make this natural based solution through the know-how of, guess what, rice terraces. It's actually like right up north of Thailand and how we deal with rainwater, how we go food, how thinking about all this building is such like a mountain, but it's useless mountain. How can it actually be part of, of how we used to live with the nature? And this is like a new generation of farmers. They come, they have iPhone, they just come to like know how to go rice. This is our culture. And this building is actually slow down 20 time runoffs, right? And get all the runoff. The rain is like pouring in this, in this region. So rather than make it um, flood the city, it's actually slow down runoff, giving uh, organic food for you and restore at the retention and pump with the solar roof. So this is, this is building, this is skin of the building and it's actually better off 
fix another problem of the food security, the public space. And it's actually got like um, the year project from, from the architecture, which I think is a very honor. And as a profession, architecture, landscape architecture, engineer need to work together hand in hand. And um, last two months, I actually got a Climate Action Award winner from the UN as a woman for result. So the other one is another way space. I'm actually working with our mayor, um, um, Mayor Aswin Kwan Meung, and many team of urban design, UDDC, the architects, the engineer. This is a um, corrupted project. And this is like a white elephant element in the city for 40 years. And it's actually just there. And we recreate it to become a first park across the river in, the, in any capital of the world. Because the structure is already there, we just like have to rethink the way space. So right now it's become very popular, especially there is just open right after the lockdown of the city. So people have place. This is the first bridge for human, for feet. The rest of the bridge in Bangkok is for car. So we actually have like place for people to hang out, have a concert and many other things. And during the COVID pandemic, we have to rethink about the health space in the hospital as well, because all these um, medical um, staff are really stressed off. So we create this like healing garden for them to using like the waste space on top of the roof. This is a government hospital, like government, not like private sector, like bring a food and many other things. And the most vulnerable sector, I'm actually gonna use another three minutes. Uh, the vulnerable sector is actually those who live in the canal, flat plain and the, the coastline. We, we actually helping them like to, to live in with a better quality of life, fixing them with the housings because with climate change, millions, millions of people will be displaced and homeless. And all these people would have problem. This is a flat plain, some, um, people in way in this area and it's flat like this. So it's like, yeah, let's build dam. So we better off, but building dam is actually flat further, further back. And it's flat at the back of the canal, um, of the dams. So we create this thing to explain with the community that this is what you are right now, like swarm, very friendly ecology. But if you have a dam, this is what your city will look like. And it's gonna flood both sides. It's, it's actually, not going to not going to help anything so i'm actually talking about how we can recreate natural and biodiversity this is such a key to this pandemic that we learned that we are interrupt the natural world without like thinking and for thailand for bangkok it's canal we have to reclaim the canal it's not a sewage way and how are we going to create that as a public space as a health space we are fighting so much about cleaning hands wearing masks we're thinking about recession. We don't even think so much about what is the climate change impact. And rather on will be biodiversity corrupts. And that is the end of many possibility that gonna keep us alive as a species as well. So thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt, for this uh, presentation. Thank you. Pour, continue, pour continuer peut-être à échanger et à réfléchir justement sur so cette... We're going to continue with a few thoughts, a few reflections about urban resilience and environment. We going to hear in Brazil, uh, we're going to hear Waculo and how this international territory is uh, faced with the Bakiribu um, floods. So this is a project that uh, entails urban restructuring and is being implemented. So we're going to hear Alain Becerra, the um, person responsible for policies, uh, regional policies. So we're going to hear him on this subject. Sir, you have the floor. Or it's uh, just yeah. There's a presentation. Just uh, just a few questions afterwards. Um, I think I saw some questions and comments from the message. And right. Yeah. This this project is a 
I only have 10 minutes, but it's been like five years plus to build this and finish this. And it's actually based on participation, talking with our stakeholder. And you, you may see that I'm, when I'm talking about natural based solution, we're talking about like top down and bottom up. We need to fix both because there's so many budget that will be built buildings and many other things. How, how can this solution insert into those kind of development? And also helping the vulnerable people to have the same solution with affordable and doable. So it's not about top down and bottom up, it's about both. And how as a designer, you can insert your solution there because the money have to spend anyway, yes. Is there any other questions maybe to uh, coach before uh, Alan speaks about Guadalupe's project? Maybe there's a, somebody else wants to. Uh, yes. No more questions from the from the public. I think it's very interesting that um, climate impact is so different from all the city. Like we are now like a global citizens and climate solution has to be from the low, from the local knowledge and using the wisdom that we used to live with nature. And we call that with technology to, to, to come back and fill in the city design. Uh, okay, Alan, uh, should I begin my presentation then? Well, okay, Alan, uh, I, we will like be first to, I'd like to first thank Kochakorn for the very interesting presentation and congratulate her for her work in Bangkok. And uh, my intervention here will be brief. I will present uh, a project that is aligned with this uh, thematic of uh, climate change and uh, water-based uh, cities, uh, I believe. Uh, Guadulhos is not located on a river delta, but I believe that it can somewhat be considered a water city, at least on a major part of its territory. Uh, here you can see the basin of the Vakirivuguasu River. Uh, it's a river, uh, the basin itself occupies uh, 145.6 uh, square kilometers of the municipality, which is about 45.6% of its total area. Uh, the main river of this basin is the Bakirivuguasu River uh, with 20 kilometer extension in Guarulhos. Uh, the river itself, uh, comes from a neighboring city, but in Guarulhos it has 20 kilometers in extension, and it is a tributary of the Chiete River uh, uh, that goes through the state capital of Sao Paulo uh, that lies next to the city of Guarulhos. Uh, I, I listed here the main tributaries of the river, but I believe that <laughs> naming all of them uh, will take uh, a lot of time. I, I believe the image itself speaks louder, uh, showing here uh, the Bakirivuguasu River in the middle and all its tributaries coming from uh, the north and, and also going south. I, we have uh, one, one small thing, uh, I believe this image still helps us uh, show, is the course of the river. This is not the natural course of the river. When they made the international airport located right here, they changed the natural course of the river. And uh, several areas north of the airport became a flood risk areas and uh, also to the west of the airport. And this is a problem that the city of Guarulhos has had to live with since the, the construction of the airport in the 80s. Uh, and right now, the city under our mayor Gucci uh, got an approval of the Development Bank of Latin America, CAF, to for a macro drainage uh, project on the basin of the Bakirivuguasu River. So 
when on the parts that it is in the city of Guadalupe. Uh, here are some images of the flood problems we have. Uh, all of these areas are close to the Bakirivu River. Uh, here to the north uh, are more recent photos from 2019. And uh, down here, uh, some photos from 2015. So it's a, a chronic problem that's been happening for years. Uh, and we aim now with this project to be able to solve it uh, through uh, decisive interventions on the canal. This is the current uh, status of the river and, and its canals. Uh, there are some parts that it has travesties. Uh, you, it goes through pipes under some covered areas, but as you can see, uh, the area suffered a very heavy human intervention. And this is an overview of the project. Uh, the project uh, foresees a full restoration of the canal and uh, also some reservoirs uh, to help mitigate the flood problems. The Bakirivu, uh, as, the, as happens with the Chiete River and many rivers on this region, is, uh, has meanders. And usually it has a natural dynamic of flooding, so it has uh, swampy areas around its curves uh, that when naturally, when precipitation comes, they become flooded and they tend to be wet uh, a large part of the year, but not, not occupied by water. So these uh, reservoirs tend to be located near these regions where the natural meanders of the river were. Uh, this overview here shows uh, in a bit more graphic manner the location of the interventions. The orange circles and the green circle are uh, parks and uh, leisure uh, interventions. And the purple areas, uh, the purple square areas are the reservoirs. Uh, and the purple uh, areas with uh, clear lines will be interventions executed by the state government, which was the original uh, responsible for the for this kind of water body, you know, for dealing with this kind of water body that crosses many cities. Uh, the initiative of the city of Guarulhos happened because it was one of the cities that suffered the most from the floods. So it had to take matters in its own hands. And so with the assistance of CAF, we now have a, a an horizon to look forward to solving this. This is a, a quick overview of one of the main interventions uh, of leisure, the, the park on the Movinos community. Uh, there are, uh, it's a community that has been established north of the airport. Uh, it's the green uh, area on this, this dot here. Uh, and uh, there are several measures that are planned uh, under this project. Uh, the uh, adequating the infra mobility infrastructure around the area, uh, the João Zarife Avenue that crosses here, and also the interventions on the canal of the Bakirivu Guasu River that margins this avenue. And these uh, wetlands, they already exist as wetlands, and they will having, have the function of as a natural reservoirs for the meanders of the river when uh, uh, the precipitation comes and uh, increases the, the water volume. So now I'll pass by quickly to some uh, pictures of concepts of, of this intervention. Uh, there are some uh, more sustainable uh, technologies that we aim to incorporate on the project, such as uh, solar energy. And we also aim to increase the permeable area.
and that's it. It's a, a quick presentation. Um, if we have the time, Elaine, I will just like to share one last picture uh, about the geography of the city of Guarulhos, just to illustrate uh, how our geography works. Uh, north of the city, we have the Cantareira uh, chain. Uh, it's, it's not very high mountain-wide. Uh, it's not actual mountains, technically speaking, but it's a, a higher altitude. And uh, down here uh, on this lower uh, area in green, you can see the basin of the Baquiribu River. So usually the water comes from uh, the higher uh, altitudes, uh, the chaining, and it comes down to the plains down here. And the lowest area on the south is the uh, is where the Chiete River is located. And I believe that's it. Thanks a lot. Alan. Merci beaucoup. Merci pour cette présentation. Je crois que vous aviez euh, une... Thank you. I think that you have a couple of questions uh, that you had for Coach Akko. Coach, uh, do you still have the time to take these questions? I think you were busy and you had to leave. Do you have the time to take these questions? Do you hear me, Coach Akko? Thanks to the, the team of the INMC uh, forwarding uh, many of the, the materials. Uh, and we had uh, a few questions that we believe, we believe this initiative, the project itself has not been executed. Uh, the, the financing has been approved by the development bank and we will start to uh, uh, make the bids for contractors for the several interventions that will be made. Uh, but regarding this project and Kochakon's work, I believe that uh, I just trying to find here my where I made the notes of the questions. Uh, but the first question, uh, I'll go by heart here. Uh, the first question is uh, Kochakon. Uh, Looking at this overview of our issues and our project, do you believe that this kind of initiative communicates with the uh, Poro City initiative that you aim to promote worldwide? Um, Alan, um, can you repeat the questions again? Um, my internet connection just break up a little bit. Something oh, about sure. Poro City Network, yes. Yeah, yeah. So you, you have the Poro Cities initiative uh, that aims to uh, encourage uh, more, uh, uh, more projects that uh, aim for a more uh, harmonic uh, relation yes. with the water dynamics. And what I wanted to ask if looking at this overview of the Bakirivu River Basin and uh, of this project that we aim to do, do you believe it, it can incorporate something from this Poro Cities initiative? It already incorporates something. So just you can talk a bit more about this Poro City initiative and maybe give us a few hints on how we can improve or Thank you, Alan, and I really appreciate your work. And I just feel that I agree. When we talk about watersheds, we have to think about it as a system. And it's in. But the context in Bangkok is very different. Like our city is so dense that we cannot just like rip, rip off all the buildings and things. So when it's come to the implementation, I just feel that um, to, to keep that system systematic planning is very important and it's very hard because each project needs to shift and it takes so much time, takes so much effort. And for the Poro City Network, I'm actually really believe in people process. And I just feel that in every dot that, that you mentioned about each project, like the parks and many like canals, we actually need to, a participatory process, but normally in normal practice, 
the client don't care. They just want what they want. So having porosity parallel to what I'm practicing or what we are doing, it's, it's actually completing the whole process that this space is not only belong to, to those who pay, but it's belong to all the stakeholder. And I think that's the key to climate change solution. We have to have everyone involved as much as possible. We have to make it doable. We have to make it affordable to, to each local, like to Bangkok, to in your country and to many other country. We cannot just buy technology and then fit it in. It's not gonna work like that. So I really appreciate the way you um, approach from the regional scale and into the each individual project which I think is, yes, it's, it's a lot of efforts, but yes. And people process is very important. Um, I believe there is a question from uh, Adrian Sanchez uh, in Querétaro. Uh, he says, in the development of uh, your projects, what is the role of social participation? Uh, How's the population involved? Ellen or myself? To coach, to you, to coach. Or coach. Oh, okay. Um, when I work with a vulnerable community, they don't have money, they don't have budget, but they've been displaced. So the government said, you cannot live here, it's flood. You cannot live here, the sea level rise is coming. So what is solution for these people? So we actually go help and coming up with the negotiation through design. Okay, you can live at the same place, but you have to go vertical and you have a space enough for the flat plane. So this is like, um, when I mean people process and when I say design let um, initiate. So we come up with a solution with them to negotiate with government, to negotiate with those private sector that are gonna donate the money. So this is, this is what the process have. Yeah, like we talk with many people and coming up with the solution that all wins, yes. Thank you. Is Are there any other questions? If we don't have more questions from the chat, I have a second question. Mm -hmm. We we had. C'est ça, Alan. Je crois qu'il y a une autre question sur le, le macro drainage. Allez-y. Oui, oui. C'est votre question. Yes, yes there uh, is another question. Uh, it was your question. We had uh, prepared was uh, to uh, Coach Acorn about how are the best practices uh, today, considering the advancements on landscape architecture for uh, uh, dealing with macro drainage of, of in such a large, large scale and uh, what kind of, of uh, observations from landscape architecture would you uh, make uh, considering uh, people who like aim to build a reservoir or something, you believe that this um, uh, matched uh, circular economy approach to not only make a reservoir, but make also a, a farm and uh, something like that is an approach that can be widened outside of the context of Bangkok uh, that has a, a rice culture, if I believe I, I, I I understood correctly from the presentation that, and the materials uh, to other cultures like here on, on Brazil. Uh, while we don't have this same tradition, we also have, uh, uh, we don't have this cultural back, background for this kind of project. So we will have not only to create the equipment, but also to uh, promote this culture of urban farming. Um, actually, we are we are agriculture country. Like we, our ancestors are farmers. Like we go rice, we go rice in the swamp, and now the development of the city is like expanding with no limit, and this is the problem. We not even preserve the rice, um, the agriculture land use that is is will help us holding the water. And right now the problem is the rain is like pouring and when it's drowned, we have, we don't have enough fresh water. Yeah, so I think this is like the, the balance that we need to see in the macro scale. 
but within such a density that you you yeah you can't just rip off and go rise again. We have to think about how we're gonna deal with rain, like rainwater tank, slow down the runoff, create a very porous element as a landscape to the city. And that is not only fixing the water problem, we are also the, le the least capital in the world maybe in the top that have least public green space per capita. So we also need many other things. We also need good food because we have to go so far, maybe import the food from, it's like climate change, transportation. We have to have enough green space for us to feel healthy and we have to deal with water. So I just feel that landscape architect solution can actually fix our nature-based nature solution can actually fix many problems. It's not only just a water problem, but it's many other like public health and many other things. There's a last question uh, from Yannick Vigignol. Uh, could open data be used to share the analysis with Je the inhabitants? A... Merci, coach. Uh, I, I am uh, uh, asking a question. Uh, could open data be used to share the analysis with the inhabitants and help them to be in call, uh, involved in uh, this kind of initiative? You, you're asking Alan or you're asking me, Paulina? Uh, I'm asking you, uh, Coach. Okay, can, can you repeat it again? Yes. Of course. Uh, he's asking if open data can be used uh, to share the analysis with the inhabitants in these kinds of initiatives. When you say inhabitant, what do you mean? You mean like people or you mean like... Um, the, yes, the people. How that can we share a solution to the people? That's correct. I, I, I believe that's the sense of uh, uh, Mr. Vigignol's uh, question. Um, this uh, is well, actually... Yeah? No, uh, well, uh, maybe I, I could try to share what I, how I understood his question because it's a question that... Uh, I believe talks to our project as well is how to you how you can meaningfully involve the the people around the project with the project and I believe that he's bringing open data as a new tool and how we could use it to make this involvement meaningful so that people can actually understand what's happening and that that's how I Okay, yes. Okay, I, I get the questions right now. So I think um, as a designer, I'm, I'm feel like I'm more like a design facilitator. So you work with government, and then you work with people. And normally, the two sector doesn't combine really like well, because they're afraid of each other, like, are you gonna displace us? Or we, we have to do whatever we have to do for the government role. So I just feel that as a designer or as like a middle person, you can create a design dialogue or negotiation or giving the key message from the people to the government because they feel open to talk with us and convince the government, the, the new technology and then the world trend that we are leading. Like right now I'm working a lot with BMA and I'm so honored to work with the may our mayor. And I just feel that um, the, we, we need to, it's not about just climate solution, it's about leadership and leadership in every level that we are in. And I just feel that how can that leadership direct to the right direction is, I, I, I am just one part of the process, but how can I push everyone dialogue to be open? I think it's really important. And each culture have very different way to negotiate, to talk, to listen. And I think it's such a key that you need to listen and then finding, yeah, it, it's not about great design, great form, it's, it's about listening. Yes. Merci, coach. Merci beaucoup. Je crois Thanks a lot. I think that we need to go to the third part of the conference. So thanks a lot to Coach Korn and Alan for your speeches. And now I would like to give the floor to Jérôme Oslander, who is going to open the third session of the conference about local actions. 
local actions and resilient strategies in public services. Can you hear me now? Because I was asked by the translation agency uh, to uh, put on uh, uh, headphones because they could not hear me very well. Thanks a lot, uh, Elena. Thanks a lot, Alan uh, and Coach Corner for your speeches that were really enriching. Coach Corn, I uh, heard uh, your presentation that is even better than the presentation that I heard in Montreal in 2019. It was uh, even richer. The COVID, uh, the COVID difficulties um, even enriched your presentation. Now, we spoke about economic and environmental perspectives of resilience, and now it is time to speak about social, cultural, and human perspective. That is going to take to be the topic of the third part. Before starting this session, I would like to think about what we did in uh, the uh, in in the network after the pandemic. So, in spite of cultural, political, geographical, sociological differences of our uh, of our cities, we as uh, local governments are responsible for the good quality of uh, and the mic is off okay it is working so we are responsible for the services offered to our citizens so we had the same uh, we had to meet the same needs because of the crisis but it is interesting to see that the replies sometimes were different so this is what we would like to speak about in the third session of uh, our conference in order to share, the aim is to share good practices. And uh, we would like to speak about how we met to the same needs in Clermont-Ferrand, because after the, final, the uh, COVID crisis, we decided to take uh, urgent measures to support uh, our citizens in the mid and long term. First of all, we worked to protect the health of our citizens. And then we uh, kept essential services for people in order to protect the most vulnerable citizens, and we also try to support our businesses and economic. So first of all, we created vaccination centers to uh, for our citizens in order to smooth and accelerate vaccination procedures. We made the best to provide all the resources uh, for this. During the pandemic, we also created the health protocol to make sure that our schools were open and to keep uh, to make sure that our canteens in the schools were open as, as well as nurseries in order to fight against all form of of uh, uh, precarities and uh, uh, poverty we supported uh, our citizens in different uh, in different ways. For example, the parking places uh, uh, were for free and tra public transport were free of charge during the lockdown. And then we also um, authorized bars and restaurants to uh, to put their uh, to use uh, public terraces free of charge. So we made the best to ensure the resilience of a uh, of a city in the context of the pandemic of the pandemic now i would like to give the floor to mrs fidao susidum special advisor to the general secretary of the uclg and then also our friend Gorka Uttaran will take place, Mayor of Vitoria Gasteis and Vice President of uh, the INMC. But first, Fidardo Sosidum, the floor to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Good afternoon. I was making my, my speech in, in French. Buenas tardes para los hispano, hispano, hispanofonos. So, thanks a lot for you, your invitation. I am really happy 
because we had a really enriching a really enriching discussion and we are speaking about a really interesting topic since the beginning of uh, uh, the covid crisis we've uh, uh, participated to many discussions uh, lots of conferences about covid how to react to covid how to face covid how local governments can tackle this crisis Perhaps we should start by with a really clear idea. Because of the pandemic, uh, activities uh, had to slow down throughout the world, economic activities, social activities, cultural activities uh, that are still uh, closed. So we had to slow down and nobody could... Uh, Imagine that we should, uh, that we could do it in, uh, in in such a way. The pandemic caused many problems, but first of all, I would like to recommend and to suggest what were the opportunities offered by the crisis. In many countries, uh, there were lockdowns, total or partial. During the lockdown, we could have opportunities that were unthinkable before. For us, pandemic enabled us to think a possible reversibility, so to fight against climate change to go back in the climate change, as it were, at some level. Then we also saw that it was possible to live in a different way. Business as, us as usual is no longer an option, as David Miller uh, said it at the beginning of the co this conference. I think that it is the absolutely true. We all agree on that. Then, uh, in the past, it was not even possible to think that we could change our economic model. During the first lockdown between March and July, many countries started thinking about a new model, such as Morocco, for example. They had already started this process, but they, but they furthered this uh, discussion about new model, human capital, a new social model. Then we also started thinking about a new impact on the environment. For example, there, were, there was a slowdown in public transport, less uh, uh, flights. But now, while we're getting ready to the new normal, we should perhaps think more about the possible perspectives, uh, as it was suggested by different governments, but also businesses, because some of these businesses have a, a global impact in different areas of the world. And then uh, our uh, relationship with nature. So uh, this affects people in, in rural areas mainly. So we should think about what is going to, uh, to, to happen after the pandemic in order to think about new models. And there are different possibilities, different, uh, uh, different models that we could uh, adopt. First of all, what are the risks of the pandemic, the risks and opportunities of the pandemic, more in detail. This pandemic turns into an opportunity to do things differently in order to create a new balance, a new urban planning, a new way to create and to design urban and rural areas. For example, we could think about a new type of migration from big cities to intermediate cities. And we saw also that in some cases, 
people migrated from intermediate cities, uh, mid-sized cities, to small areas because they were uh, afraid that they could not really have access to public transport, they were not sure that they could have access to hospitals, and this created uh, this uh, uh, wave of migration from mid-sized cities, uh, towns, to smaller cities. This could have an impact on uh, our current uh, urban model because so far today there were lots and lots of people concentrating in, in uh, big metropolis that, that created problems uh, for cities so what is the kind of resilience that we're looking for we already started looking at it during the COVID, but what is going to come next after the COVID? I would like to, to go back and think about models used in some uh, in big cities. There are five capitals of resilience social, economic, cultural, environmental, and human capital. If we cannot have resilience if you do, do not have resilience in, uh, uh, in a human capital. And when we have a certain balance, uh, when we manage to balance these five capitals, then we can start speaking about resilience. We need uh, to uh, create a sort of balance among the five types of, of uh, capitals. We implemented this principle in some areas, in some cities where we worked uh, uh, for the intermediate program of UCLG, we implemented the World Agenda, especially 2030 World Agenda, and uh, we achieved some good results. So considering the five types of capital that I mentioned, we could also include a, a paradigm that is uh, the participation of uh, a citizen because uh, the pandemic taught us that uh, we could do things uh, actually since the beginning of the pandemic we launched some consultations two or three times a week with local governments And the topic was how they lived uh, COVID and how and uh, what were what was the social impact of the pandemic? And unprecedented in some cases. Local governments uh, did a lot. When we capitalize all that we heard from them, they spoke about, for example, the role played by the digital uh, factor. Actually, the digital resources, uh, even uh, if they even were uh, a factor of, of marginalization because those who were not really familiar with the digital tools were excluded, they were marginalized. And uh, they also mentioned another topic that is uh, public services and the big conclusion emerging from this consultation was this public services is one of the most important factor linked to the survival of uh, of our populations it is something connected not uh, just uh, to local governments but also to citizens because uh, in some cases uh, public services were considered were given for granted but in some cases uh, they were they were not because they were really important public services uh, especially in southern uh, part of the world uh, enabled uh, 
people to survive because there were food shortages. For example, in uh, in the poorest uh, areas of uh, the cities, uh, there are people who really had uh, difficulty in having access to food during the COVID crisis. The pandemic showed uh, all the weaknesses uh, of uh, our current lifestyle. So there are actually we could see big problems such as inequalities. Inequality is really the problem, the issue is nothing new actually. But really COVID really showed us the importance of uh, of the, the importance of the, the problem the seriousness of this problem, inequalities. Within the UCLG, after this consultation, we came up with a decalogue, so with 10 rules about uh, uh, the post-COVID, the post -COVID. so how to generate resilience and, and how to support uh, local governments. We should not also forget that the 2030 World Agenda is still a reference, a benchmark for the world. There is also a need to insist, to stress the importance of, of a consistent multilateralism. And it's also a matter of trust. People need to trust this multilateralism. This is crucial in uh, cooperation, but also in uh, relationships among different uh, uh, governments. Uh, local governments need to play their role in this context of uh, multilateralism as they play a crucial role. This, there is international governments, national governments, uh, governance, but also local and regional governments have their role to play. And we redeveloped in, uh, and we reworked on the notion of uh, ecologic transition that should not only be in a transition but also a transformation and uh, it is uh, uh, it is linked to different sectors it is something um, that should be it should be in all agendas so when it comes uh, to transport it is a cross-disciplinary priority linked uh, uh, to gender issues uh, Ecological tra transformation is linked to peace. In it should be integrated in all the different agendas, because thanks to ecological transition, it will be possible to define the post-COVID as we want it to be. But especially as citizens are asking, are urging. and I have asked during the lockdown. So I've already spoken about the cross-disciplinary um, role of uh, ecologic uh, transition. Within the UCLG, we also carried out uh, a consultation about the climate change, but not only about climate change, it is a consultation for each region of uh, the world where we have uh, uh, where we are present. So in this consultation, we saw that uh, COVID is very much linked to the climate crisis. Uh, climate is uh, a luxury or should it be integrated in urban policies and local policies? Our aim ever since, uh, from our standpoint, is uh, 
to identify some topics, world uh, topics important for the whole world that can be at the basis of future policies together with the regional and local governments and together with the national governments. So once again, this concept of multilateralism. In this consultation, five big topics emerged. Without COVID, they would have been priorities as well. But uh, once again, we connected them to the uh, green recovery. So first of all, capacity building and training. So not only human capital, but also about leadership and how some of these consultation and inquiries, and I think um, uh, Mr. Aslander was saying the biggest challenge for the local governments is not only to respond to health emergency, economic emergency, but also to be up to the necessary and required invest investment called forth in climate change. Many local governments were working on it, but now they need to press on and to invest on public service, which are at the heart of resilience and urban resilience at the moment, not only to up to a response um, for the needs emerging, but also to, to keep, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I've, I've gone Time. I'm so sorry, but they need to keep in their mind this idea of resilience. Very quickly, a last issue about um, last uh, the local for action. Uh, I, I'm just going to keep a, a minute, the very end of my intervention, to show you a video. Um, uh, this started back in 2020, but it took a great relevance, um, particular relevance uh, during pandemics. Local Fraction App should give visibility to local governments who develop solutions and with the new horizon to be able to implement them uh, globally speaking through UC. LG. So having a label, a label that they want to specifically develop and to share and to make it visible worldwide uh, for any anybody in the in the global arena like United Nations and all the big organizations that we we know or we, we heard from Bridgewater and all of these uh, wonderful examples. So I would invite you all to be part of this dynamics of the, the this label, this label that would be shareable, so to say, uh, subject to be shared. Globally speaking, you're more than welcome to join in with us. Uh, just a, a final comment, if you allow me, about the cities on, on water, cities running the risk of being, of sinking. And well, of course, it is very important and how we can, we can do what we can do and participate with those cities and the many projects. I think regardless of the city and the size, I think we need to, to be prepared to be more and more in participation with the citizens globally to be able to secure urban resilience through participation and involvement, citizenship involvement in the globe. That is absolutely important. And France is a good example, but there are many good examples. And we need to strike the right balance, not only social, but on human capital. Uh, cities should continue to grow, but striking the right balance between human capital, social capital, and working for the transformation 
and we're working on this declaration, this declaration and there's also the declaration of human rights i mean what kind of planet are we leaving to uh, future generations i mean are they going to suffer from our decision making today what kind of decisions are we making what kind of negative impact this can have for our future generations uh, decisions made in cities and countries to be bold to be daring enough to to take and to make the right decision to make the right changes, everything that is absolutely necessary for our future. We would all be accountable for future generations if we don't make the necessary changes. So for future generations sake, we need to leave them a livable planet, a planet that is nice to live in. So I'd like to leave it here. And maybe if you have some further questions, I will take it them later. I'd like to share a video. It's just a one minute video to um, share with you um, these ideas that I've been elaborating on. Here we go. Je peux, oui, parfait. Um, can I? Yes, I think I will be able to share the screen with you. So we interpreters hope that video is uh, at least with English subtitles. So for English speaking people, we will um, allow you to just read it or listen to it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you for this very uh, international perspective. Comparing the impact of pandemics, it was fascinating. I've seen uh, that we had a few questions. So I've shown on the chat box the link to UCLG, so where you can check up initiatives that are very that are of high value for everyone. So um, I now would like to leave the floor to Gorka uh, Urtaran, the uh, Victoria um, uh, City Mayor. So we're going to leave him the floor to talk about the, his own experience from a local point of view about how resilience has played a role in Victoria with the uh, experience of pandemics. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Jerome. Good afternoon, everyone from Victoria. I am very happy to see friends such as Jerome from Clermont Ferrand, David, David Water, and all our friends from the network it is a real pleasure i will try to be very brief just in i will take five minutes to tell you about victoria where we did very similar things to things which were implemented elsewhere as jerome said 
what did we do in Vitoria? We wanted to protect the health of people, well-being of people, as well as local economy. City halls, uh, municipalities, uh, cities, we have several priorities such as protecting the health of people, protecting our social well-being and fostering and supporting local economies. We have collaborated with the appropriate institutions to guarantee uh, the provision of health as well as uh, protection to essential workers. As for the well-being, we paid attention to vulnerable people, the, the elder, the people with uh, minors in a vulnerable situation and uh, homeless people in social exclusion. We paid attention in particular to these groups and vis-a-vis -vis the local economy, we take uh, some measures vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the traders, the, the PMEs, the, the SMEs, uh, sorry. During this uh, pandemic, we focused on these three pillars, health, well-being, and support to local economy. And uh, towards the future, we think that the cities, the European cities are facing a very appropriate uh, roadmap. We are aligned on the Green Deal European strategy as uh, underlined by its president, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen. This uh, green strategy, this uh, green recovery is uh, an absolute must need for the cities of the future. We are perfectly aligned with the 2030 agenda, the SDGs, and we must have this uh, triple, this uh, threefold dimension as uh, David Miller told us, uh, also the environmental and the weight of the cities as mentioned by Jerome. Regarding this, we want to focus on a couple of things. There are many of them, but just to center the message. The urban planning has to be um, people-oriented, people-focused. This is very important. To this regard, we are developing um, proximity resources, social and sport resources. We must implement proximity services. And we are working on the project of the so-called super manzanas, super uh, areas of uh, buildings. Only 36% of uh, public space is devoted to people. Now, in the future, 70% of the urban space will be devoted to pedestrians. We want this uh, urban planning to be thought to be oriented to people and the development of uh, um, sumideros of uh, CO2. I mean, so we can trap the CO2. So we are amongst the, the cleanest cities in Europe. We are fostering a sustainable mobility where more than 60% of displacements are, of travels are, done by bike or on foot. We want the transports to be electric. We are working for uh, this urban transformation, these uh, structures to create this CO2 trap uh, systems. We want to refurbish uh, existing housing. We are also working on the green impact uh, so we can generate energy communities that generate their own energy through solar panels, these uh, photovoltaic uh, panels. So the consumption of energy is sustainable 100%. And last but not least, the future of the planet passes uh, through the future of the cities because we gather most of the worldwide inhabitants. We are causing the majority of CO2 emissions. So we have to be all aligned towards this sustainable recovery. 
and a network such as the Michelin uh, network is a great opportunity. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I think we all share your conclusion that the, um, an important part of this pandemic is that it is absolutely important to take into account the local authorities to, to support everything that is social, environmental and financial growth. So we've taken a little bit of, of delay. I don't know if we have any more questions. I mean, we don't have questions on the chat box. No, no questions. So we're going to leave immediately the floor to the mayor of um, uh, Queretaro, Luis Bernardo Nava, who is going to uh, talk to us in a video making an announcement that we are all concerned with. with Amigas y amigos. There we go. So it was the mask, ladies and gentlemen. I am very glad to greet you. The pandemic that we are facing today was a proof. We developed a concrete strategy from economic direct support to population, as well as the COVID test in homes. Many of these actions were inspired in the successes of other cities around the world within this view of community that has to unite us. This video conference around the urban resilience response to this spirit. In addition, we are very happy and very proud to, to host the third conference of the network that will be held in September. As you know, during the last General Assembly, we approved, we accepted to adopt five of the the SDGs that will help us to measure more precisely the scope of our actions. It will be a pleasure to greet you there, to host you, to welcome you in Querétaro, your city, a big and a warm hug. We are waiting for you in Querétaro. So, Luis Navas, thank you so much for this kind invitation. We do hope and we cross our fingers for um, the health situation and circumstances to allow us to hold this first um, well, I mean, this, this conference in, in Kiritaro, so I'd like to thank, naturally, the participants today and for the efforts made for uh, all of my family and friends. We were more than 130 people in this conference, so I'd like to thank everyone and all of uh, everyone who made the effort to be here today with us. Your contribution were really wonderful. Thank you very much to Atenao interpreters for being here with us, translating and making our exchanges more fluid. And uh, as I said, you have the, um, the website here where you can continue with our exchanges and no doubt we will continue to hold this virtual meeting. So needless to say, I will say see you soon and see you hopefully in Keritaro and we will continue with this common um, cooperation um, for our local territories, for our citizen. Thank you so much and we see you soon. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Merci à tous.